So we're opening it up, so we have different uh, stakeholders here. And now to discuss what's coming up next, I'm very honored to have with me here today again Sir Charles, who you remember. Uh, he is from the director of the Oxford Martin School and he gave the keynote lecture, which I, again, I'm digesting and uh, remain impressed with. Uh, we have also with us Ursula Oesterle from the EPFL. We have Lindy V. Uh, Mayele Sibandi. We have uh, Professor Stefan Falzer and we have Mr. Kamesh Elayosula. And last but not least, we have online Karen Fabry. And I will introduce our dear panelists a bit more. So, so Charles, you, you, you remember from yesterday, Ursula, just to give a short introduction, she is the Vice President for Innovation at the EPFL. So she is really at the intersection between the science and the translation. So she has a long experience in academia and industry, and she's now really pushing to move towards innovations, engaging with startups, but also with larger organizations. So very pleased to have you here for the panel, Ursula. Um, then the next one is moving to Lindivy. So Lindivy is a recognized leader, but also a practicing farmer. So, and an esteemed policy advisor with a career of spanning over 30 years. So we have deep insights here that we will hear. And I think there are a few elements that I think are important also to share about Lindivy. So she's the director and chair of the African Research Universities Alliance, so which is a center for excellence in sustainable food systems. So. <laughs> You see the connect with our topic here. But she's also the incoming research chair for sustainable food systems at the food Future African Institute. And last but not least, uh, one, more one more component, she's also the SDG 20, SDG 12.3 champion, which is the reducing food loss and waste. So we bring an additional element. John had been alluding it shortly yesterday, this morning, sorry, it feels like a whole day, uh, this morning. So that, I think, is also something that we, can, that we can rely on. Last but not least, I would like to mention that she's sitting on multiple international boards, including uh, on the, director, uh, the board of directors for Nestle. So very warm welcome, Lindy. Uh, let me move to uh, my dear chef, Stefan. So he's uh, uh, basically the CTO, so he's responsible and actually also the one that made it happen. So if it wasn't for Stefan, I think we wouldn't be here all. So thanks very much for that also in first place, Stefan. And to introduce him, he's the CTO of Nestle since 2018 and uh, with that responsible for research, development and innovation, obviously. And so he's also a professor for food and chemical engineering at the universities of Hamburg, Stuttgart, Sheffield, and Copenhagen. So warm welcome, Stefan. Uh, turning now to Kamesh. Kamesh is a chief innovation and quality officer and a member of the executive team at Olam Food Ingredients, OFI short. Uh, he oversees a global network of innovation centers and drives quality and food safety across over 100 food ingredient manufacturing plants. And currently, Kamesh serves as the founding member of the Asia Innovation Council of the Conference Board. Warm welcome, Kamesh. Last but not least, I'm very pleased to introduce Karen. Karen is Deputy Head of Unit Bioeconomy and Food Systems, Healthy Planet Directorate, DG Research and Innovation at the European Commission. That's a mouthful. Uh, luckily, I... Could work, work. <laughs> I could walk through this. She has over decades, uh, two decades of work experience uh, at the European Commission, where she worked in various positions focusing on the interface between science and policy. So I am very, really also looking forward how we you know, make that intersection happen between the science and eventually policy making. She's currently leading the Food 2030 work at the Directorate uh, General for Research and Innovation, where she is responsible for the development of EU research and innovation policy for sustainable, healthy, and inclusive food systems. So warm welcome. With that large, diverse um, range of expertise, I would like to now turn the words to each of you to give a short perspective. And um, what I asked our panelists to address is to understand, okay, we spoke a lot about healthy and sustainable food system. What is your understanding? How do you define the healthier and sustainable food system? What does it mean for you in your respective role? Which challenges can uh, and do you address with your organization, with other stakeholders? Who are your key stakeholders? What are the solutions moving forward? And eventually also, what's the scale and impact that you, that, that you expect we can create? So with that, uh, Sir Charles, do you want to kick us off? 
Thank you very much, Petra. Uh, of course, I'm an academic sitting on a panel with many people who actually make food and sell food and things like that, so I'm probably the least qualified person to actually make a difference. But I would like to make a couple of ref reflections, and certainly as someone who is a food systems person but not a nutritionist, and one of the reasons, I think this is my third Nestle conference, and I so enjoy uh, meeting the nutritionists here and uh, hearing the latest research. And something that has really struck me is in many of the talks that issues of nutrition and is issues of sustainability have come together in a way that just did not happen um, ten, year, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, I find that really encouraging. Uh, some of the research that we've heard, heard today uh, and yesterday, which really has these dual objectives of trying to do both, is, is uh, tremendous. Um, so that's one reflection. The second reflection I would make is um, I think it is critically important that people who care about nutrition and people who care about the environment <coughs> talk to each other and work together. Um, as someone who comes more from the environment end than from the nutrition end and who believes that um, inevitably we in the rich world in North America, in Europe, we do need to eat less meat. Um, there is just no possible way that we're going to get to net zero unless we eat less, less meat. Uh, and I know this worries some of my nutritionist friends who point out that meat is a really good source of bioavailable micronutrients and things. And I think we should avoid there being a conflict between those two messages and work together to see how they can be resolved. And I think we've seen some really nice research in the last two days on that. Um, I also worry in looking to um, my friends in the audience here from Africa that sometimes the, um, the argument from people like me that we need to uh, eat less meat will be applied to people uh, on very low incomes whose only source of protein and other mic micronutrients are meat and living in societies where livestock is a really important com component of, uh, of their culture. So I think we have to be very cautious, us in the rich world where we're over-consuming, that our message is not misunderstood in the, in, in, uh, in the global south in this. And I, I'm optimistic that these different agendas are going forward in parallel, but I think it needs some positive effects that we continue talking, we continue relating to each other, and we don't get a false dichotomy between these two different agendas. Thank you so much. This was uh, very insightful. Um, now, Ursula, in your perspective, working at the intersection between academia and innovation and startups and larger companies, what, what's your views? So, first of all, I think we academias worldwide are a gold mine of new knowledge resources across everything from soil science all the way to organizational, uh, sorry, psychological and behavioral science all the way through. Um, but also in processing, in storage and things. And it's totally underutilized, okay? And if we tend to look at like-minded things. We tend to look at there's a chair of professor uh, on food something, let's go look there. But there's a lot of research done for other purpose that can be repurposed relatively easily um, to re re really harness some of the systemic challenges that we have. So I think that's something we should really, really look into. Now, the challenge is Academia is also silo. Each professor has his expertise. The problems we have are all systemic, okay? So we have to, somebody has to put them together. And then the business model, okay? Academia gets research funding a lot from science foundations and things to do publications, okay? The ca career of a professor is publications. It's not commercializations, okay? So there is this death valley, this gap in between. And we really need to all work together of how we can bridge this better to get over this death valley. Now, startups are often seen as one way to do it. <coughs> but a startup has a venture capital behind him who actually wants to make money, okay? While we are all looking for impact and maybe strategic value, which is not always the, the only a startup business model. So we have to look at other Way. So we really have to look at other academia um, industry business models and start to think in groups, in clusters, okay, 
One example, for example, we have is a working group of corporates who want to do net positive manufacturing supply chain. This is non-core assets, but you want to share the resources and share the risk of bridging this gap, and then each company goes on. So there's a need for collaboration, there's a need for corporates plus government, uh, startups, and then also regulatory to kind of work on an early stage. So I think that is, uh, we're losing a lot of taxpayers' money, actually, because a lot of academia is taxpayers' money. <laughs> The second point I'd like to make is also data and AI. So the future is blending data and AI with science or engineering. Okay, again, we tend to look at material engineering, but it's a combination of the two. And you can see it, we're using AI for new drug medication uh, discoveries. Okay, pharma is going down the drain, uh, going down that way. We have um, AI's artificial nose for senses and smells, okay? That is used to create new flavors. Those are being developed. But we're also using AI for user behavior, understanding user behavior beyond what you saw here, or even for nudging people to change behavior. So there's a whole lot of things that AI can do, all the way to using AI to do research in science, or AI to look at new business opportunities. Now, okay? Ultimately, there's a user behind it, and AI has its limits. We're all emotional, and when it comes to food, you know, our memories, our um, addictions to foods, our joy of foods, they all play a role. And this we see with the students, okay? So we have students, which are a great user base, plus the researchers, and because they like to explore, they're scientists, they will also test on themselves. And so while we're trying to get them to more plant-based food and less meat, um, we are seeing students who now say, oh no, I'm doing 100% meat diets, okay? So we're seeing all these things. So you can preach, you can teach, but then it's ultimately the consumers. Thank you so much, Ursula. So uh, Lindy B, with your large background and also you know, like your practice experience, could you share your thoughts? Thank you very much. I think for me, the two days has been like, uh, it's just as well my grandmother died 20 years ago. She must be turning in her grave listening to us talking about farm to fork, something she practiced naturally on her one hectare farm. I learned farming from her because we farmed for food, we farmed for nutrition, we farmed for a healthy environment, but also for the pocket, for the income that she generated. So it was diversity. We had sweet potatoes for breakfast, in between, there was an orchard. You could grab a guava or a mango any time you wanted to. For lunch, we would have um, traditional vegetables. And for dinner, we would have meat with vegetable, and it was one small piece of meat. When we came home for the holidays from the city, we always made sure that there was a goat that was slaughtered, and that goat would sustain all the 20 grandchildren over a three week period because the meat was rationed. It was that one piece per day. But when we went back to the city, we carried all the food that we needed for the three months that we were at school in the city. So it wasn't just the five children from my family, it was the 25 grandchildren from my grandmother's five children. So what that means is that the farm was able to provide a diverse, nutritious diet that was not over-processed because it was from farm to fork. Now, where did we get it wrong? We got it wrong because suddenly the market was the pull factor. We had to go monoculture because my maize had a good price. So it meant if you grow more maize, you could send it to the grain marketing board and get income. And that income would allow you to pay school fees, would allow you to buy the things that are not in the village, which would be a fancy bed, a stove, and many other things that was aspiration then. What did happen then is that people then left the village because the yields went down. They went to the city to get jobs. When they got to the city, they wanted highly processed foods because that's a sign of development. French fries became the food. It was cheaper. It was a sign of class. We heard this morning that if you eat cassava in Ghana, you're like, hmm, you're a village girl. You should be eating town food. But where are we now? We are the museum for stunting. We are the museum for undernourishment. So what should we be doing? I think 
for me, it's going back to those foods, those traditional foods, the millet, the sorghum brew, the whole grains that we ate in the village, but bring them in a manner that will allow less energy for processing, but more important, take advantage of the palate of this generation that ate the grandmother's foods that will now reintroduce the food to our children. Most of our children in Africa have lost that palate because they've become the fast food generation. So if we're really going to deal with healthy diets that are affordable, let's look at the traditional foods, the local foods. Let's add value by bringing the science to process them. That's why at my university, at the Future Africa Center, we are focusing on five things. We are looking at consumer-driven African foods that are affordable. We are looking at African livestock because there are communities where livestock is the go-to food, but we are saying how do we make sure that there is enough and it's produced in a sustainable way. We are also looking at African crops. We are looking at policies because that's where we've gotten it wrong. We don't have evidence-based policies that will promote those African crops to be turned into food that gets into the African pantry. We have the imported foods in our pantries and they are, in most cases, not affordable for the local community. Then finally, we are looking at climate smart food systems. And the focus is transdisciplinary research because unless we start with the societal challenge, we'll stay in our silos and research for publication. But now we're saying let's do research that will bring the food from the farm to the fork, but don't leave the consumer behind. Walk with those who are most affected by the problem and those are the people that need the food the most. So that's what we're doing. Great, thanks so much, Lenny. We, it was uh, very insightful. So, Kamesh, turning to you as an ingredient supplier, I think you have probably an additional perspective that complements the others. Please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Petra. Thank you, Stefan, for inviting me. Uh, you know, one of the challenging aspects of a team like this is, you know, you have such learned, amazing people here, and what context can you provide? So, I thought I'll bring, uh, you know, the supply chain perspective which might be a little uh, you know, unique from our standing point, right? So just to give you a quick background on who we are so you, so you get the answer on why the information I provide has that context. So we are active in over 50 origins. We, we supply, we work directly with farmers, cocoa, uh, nuts, spices, you know, uh, dairy, multiple different ingredients. But the most important thing for us is, you know, we've always started where the ingredients are produced. So we were, you know, in remote parts of Nigeria when we started, you know, 35, 34 years back. Uh, we, we, were, we were in Ivory Coast, et cetera. So we have a deep bonding with farming communities. Today, we directly work with 428,000 farmers. We operate with a networks of close to 2.5 million farmers, right? So that creates this unique perspective with which I'm gonna provide you some ideas. So basically three themes to talk about. The first one is what I call context-based solutioning. I think there's a lot of lift and shift uh, that happens sometimes where we don't necessarily think through how those ideas would apply, right? And many companies spend a lot of money. In fact, one of the themes I've heard many times is, you know, sustainability is very expensive. You know, who's going to pay for it? You know, it turns out in my mind, there's a lot of money already being paid for, which isn't necessarily delivering value. So if you can begin to repurpose that using, con you know, context-based solutioning, I think you can get a lot more value out of it. And uh, every little conversation I've been able to get through in these two days, I've been trying to promote that idea, you know, with various different people. But I'll just give you simple examples. You know, there are multiple stakeholders. They all have different motives. They have different outcome, you know, orientation, different things that they're trying to achieve. You know, how can you knit it all together? How can you create an alliance or, you know, group of people that'll, uh, uh, you know, allow for that entire supply chain to blossom and get benefits. Hopefully in the rebound session, I'll be able to give some examples you know, in the second part of it. The second topic is really, when we talk about diversifying diets, you know, uh, the two part particular things that I think are very exciting, you know, we've, I think, become more and more sophisticated in becoming food chemists. 
you know, I think there's an opportunity to go back to more natural solutions where everything doesn't have to be over-processed. Stefan, I think, was saying yesterday, you know, processing is valuable, but over-processing is probably not all that great. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things we can do by being more creative. Just simple stuff we have discovered by using nut ingredients, using spices, we are able to reduce salt and sugar in many formulations, you know. And uh, so it, it doesn't have to be very complex ingredients with hard e-labels, e-numbers to solve that, right? Uh, another example, I'll go into detail probably in the rebounds part, but you know, uh, cassava, you know, we really start talking about cassava. You know, I've tried to incorporate cassava. It's a nightmare because sourcing it free of weevils and storage pests and free of all kinds of garbage is very difficult. And you know, cassava, you know, uh, you know, understanding of cassava is very poor compared to wheat. So how do you incorporate it into a bakery product? What does it take? You know, all that BRC certification, quality food safety folks have to be brought in to help build that supply chain, build that capability. And finally, uh, this probably is my personal passion, which is biomass. We are generating a massive amount of biomass as we speak. So all the uh, energy is already you know, there, the greenhouse emissions, everything are there, and we are throwing it away. And in many cases, it becomes a problem. Right? We are trying to figure out how to dispose it and cause issues. If we can find ways to upcycle that material, and by the way, this is not only at the agricultural stage, it's also at the factory stage. You know, you'd be amazed at the kind of waste that's generated. And there are such smart people here, I'm sure we could, if we could collaborate, we could figure out ways to turn all that into a lot of value, which will ultimately benefit the producers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramesh. And Stefan, uh, to add on to that, what's the food manufacturer perspective? Yeah, well, what's, what's very clear, and it's not specific only to us as a food manufacturer, but delivering safe, nutritious, good tasting, but also affordable food products which are produced in a sustainable way has to be the priority. If that's not happening, uh, we will not be able to solve all the, the global issues which you have. Now, what do we need for that? We need science and data. For my taste, there's still too much anecdotes around. There's too much conclusions based on single cases. I have seen X, Y, Z, and, uh, uh, and that's then taken as a granted. You see that, by the way, also in the young generation. Uh, they search their truths often in social media, and the quality of information is not always there. So we need to have data, and we have to have a very critical view, and then judge based on data. Then we need technology which works in an economic context. I'm still getting also across too many technologies which are not viable in the economic context they're made for. And uh, made a point earlier, not every technology is working everywhere. Then what else do we need? Creativity, because it's a very difficult problem to balance all those attributes on the product level. It's very difficult for our product developers. So we need creativity. And here the startups are also coming in. I think the startups and the collaboration of startups and multinationals is very beneficial because you get additional ideas. You come to innovation which at the end resonates with consumers. And I like very much the discussion that we had at the end. We have also to convince consumers about everything which is good on the scientific level, which is good on the technological level, which is good on the political level and on the NGO level. But at the end, we need to reach uh, consumers. And we need collaboration. I don't think anybody can do it alone. And it's very deadly to look only at one single aspect. And we are also coming across that. So you have people who look only at nutrition. And you have people looking only at sustainability. And it's very easy to optimize one dimension by causing collateral damage on the other dimensions. So that was also the purpose of this symposium, to show the complexity of the issue and to go from farm to fork. Actually, we started before the farm. We started with agricultural science, and we were not stopping at the fork, because at the end, we have to talk also nutrition, because uptake, uh, intake of food is not the same as uptake, bioavailability. At the end, it has to have an effect in the human being. It has to help promoting health. So that's uh, definitely what we need. And then um, we are looking also at local supply chains. And I like very much what all of you actually said. It's not every solution is working everywhere. Maybe we have clusters of markets. But, uh, and you made the point, uh, uh, Charles. Uh, if we go uh, to the Western world, meat consumption, and you showed it very nicely, is absolutely huge. 
and it has to come down, while in other countries where it's very low, we cannot ask them to further reduce. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Then you have local consumers, which have local preferences. Not everything is appreciated. If we sell a plant-based product, we might have to sell it in different parts of the world with different arguments. And, and plant-based products have many arguments. They have sustainability, they have uh, health arguments, uh, you have animal welfare. But the element in which you put up front might vary a bit. Also, you have all those benefits always there. And sometimes even for affordability, we have to go to a plant-based, a nutritious plant-based product. So this localization is something which came nicely through in this uh, symposium. It was, by the way, and I maybe mentioned in my concluding marks, the most international, international symposium we ever had, uh, which, which is uh, simply great. Huh? Uh, and so uh, spending power of consumers, extremely important. If we have consumers in, in countries where 60% of the food, or of their income is spent for food, inflation is now coming and prices are coming up, it's very clear. The starting point is the income. And then you have to see how you can make the equation work in the frame of, of this, this income. So that's very close to my heart. Uh, and uh, we have to work very hard to find the right solutions, to have enough creativity to find uh, there what works best. And last but not least, and that's great, and you hear that also from uh, Sir Charles, but from also others, food has incredible transformative power. It can really change what's happening on this globe. And that's why we are all passionate to working in this area, around the food value chain. But there's also urgency. What have you said, Charles, two years, the next two years? Maybe it's the next five years, but it's not the next 10 years. So we have to act now, and that's very exciting. I think we should feel also privileged a bit to be able to work in this area, such an impactful area. Yeah. Thank you so much, Stefan. And yeah, Karen, now over to you. How um, I'm very curious to hear, you know, from VG Research and Innovations, how you um, tackle these complex challenges, how you build bridges, and also what that means in the policy environment. So thank you, uh, Petra. I'm truly thankful for the invitation and delighted to be joining you today live from Brussels. So in my few minutes, I really wish to underline the urgency to transition towards sustainable and resilient food systems that provide healthy and nutritious food while respecting planetary boundaries. And more than ever, we need low energy, and I dare to say even to be provocative, post-fossil fuel food systems that also regenerate soil and foster biodiversity and the diversity that was mentioned by Lindewee, and that engage and empower communities. We know that there's no silver bullet, there's no single leverage point, so we need to work simultaneously on many fronts, and in particular to deploy solutions that can deliver co-benefits, co-benefits to climate, environment, health, inclusion, prosperity, and minimize trade-offs, and that engage all actors, so private and public sectors, NGOs, CSOs, civil society, research organizations, and academia, at all levels, from local to global and global to local. And we need a systems approach which acknowledges the uncertainties, the complexities, the interactions and the interdependencies between all parts of the food systems, uh, from farming to food consumption and the waste streams, uh, some of which were mentioned by, by Kamesh, and even think beyond food systems. How do we connect to water, energy, health, mobility and bioeconomy systems and their nexus? And research and innovation are key drivers in accelerating the transition to sustainable, healthy, and inclusive food systems. Research and innovation can help deliver solutions, and by this we mean approaches, business models, and technologies, and all forms of innovation, be it social innovation, institutional innovation, governance innovation. And research and innovation can furthermore help us overcome barriers and lock-ins and uncover new market opportunities, but also deliver public goods. Through our European Commission's annual framework programs for research and innovation, we've been shaping and funding research and innovation in agriculture and food since over 30 years. 
But prior to 2016, much of it was very sectoral and focused mostly on efficiency and productivity gains. Then in 2016, we developed our Food 2030 Research and Innovation Policy that provides a vision and narrative for a systemic approach to how we think and do research and innovation with whom we do it. So I heard some key words like transdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and multi-actor approaches. These are key. It's also about what we do, what kind of research and innovation, what are the leverage points, and for what. And the focus is now on impact-driven research and innovation, via which to develop, test, and deploy solutions to the urgent, complex, and interconnected challenges inherent to food systems. And via Horizon Europe, which is our current framework program for research and innovation until 2027, we are supporting projects that implement such a systemic approach to deliver co-benefits to our Food 2030 priorities. And these priorities are nutrition for sustainable and healthy diets, climate smart and environmentally sustainable food systems, circular and resource efficient food systems, and food systems innovation and empowerment of communities. And this new approach to research and innovation has implied new ways of working with new partners and to address the complexity and the challenges. And this is why in 2023, we will be launching the new Horizon Europe partnership entitled Sustainable Food Systems for People, Planet and Climate. But I'll say something about that a little later. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much. So we have really, really, I think, heard now a very diverse uh, yeah, very diverse angles of this. Uh, one thing that um, resonated and which I heard a lot was that we have a necessity to work in a food systems. It's not what we traditionally probably have been doing. Um, and so we heard about uh, silos, we heard about um, bridges. So. So Charles, can I ask you, who is really like the system, the biology systems person, um, can you help a little bit, you know, like helping us, you know, like how will these mechanisms work? How can we turn more um, from the singular view or the silos approach into systems? What are the keys? <laughs> I mean, it's very hard and what Ursula said about silos and the difficulties of trying to get, well, in my world, academics to get out of their silos and to um, look across a whole system it is, is very hard. Um, I think that the way that will happen is through multiple different actors trying to encourage it. Um, I worry, and this actually repeats what Ursula said, about the way that much of our academic research is set up, that we have the incentives wrong. And I think that we need to think about how we get the pipeline of innovation right from the fundamental science to the wonderful mm -hmm. science that, that's done in this, uh, in this building. Um, I think we need governments to try and think more, um, more systematically across a food system. Uh, I've just stepped down after seven years as chairing the Science Advisory Council for our Environment and Agriculture Department, which has food in its title, Environmental Food and Rural Affairs. And it's just extraordinarily difficult to get the um, food department to talk to the health department, not because they don't want to do it, but just that the, the structures of government are difficult. And it's too easy to say that everything is siloed because in a complex government you've got to divide it up in a private sector company, you divide up in, in, in divisions. So it has to be divided up, but you need real positive agenda to try and have mechanisms that, that cut across it. And it's genuinely difficult. I mean, we would have done it before if it wasn't. Great. No, thanks. This is, this is helpful. And if we now look, I mean, it was also obvious that uh, we cannot dissociate food nutrition from sustainability and environmental sustainability. So here, when it comes to agricultural um, aspects, uh, we have been hearing also that uh, there is, you know, like a necessity in one side to move toward more plant ways and other sides also to animal. Um, and that may sound a little bit also as a challenge in the, in the, when you look at this dialogue more, at a more global level. But when it comes now to um, balancing animal, plant, and then also taking the food ways into consideration, uh, what are avenues and what should we be thinking of uh, in bringing it together, moving forward? Lindy, can I ask you that question? Um, 
Maybe just to add in terms of breaking the silos, having gone back to academia after about 20 years of practice, one thing I find is that people don't know each other. They still go to the Faculty of Agriculture to look for a solution when it comes to food systems. Yet the best thing that's happened is moving from agriculture to food systems, whereby you are really looking from farm to fork. So what does it take? It really takes a remapping of who is who. You find people sitting in engineering doing more work that is relevant to the challenges we face than the people sitting in the faculties of agriculture. So I think the starting point becomes the question that we want to address. What is the societal challenge we are facing? Mm -hmm. And who should be around the table? Mm -hmm. And around the table doesn't mean just the academia having the answers. They are also looking for answers. It's the community that's affected also being around the table. It's government being around the table. It's industry being around the table. It's everybody who has a stake in the issue of being involved. Only then can we say we are collectively addressing the challenge we face and we can break the silos. Mm -hmm. But if we look at expertise as those who are most trained in the area, we will leave away those who could have the answers but just need sharpening and timing for things to happen. Thanks, Linnie. Stefan, you wanted to Maybe add Maybe two, two thoughts to the two questions. The first question about collaboration. Uh, obviously, what's also a way uh, is to collaborate around holistic projects, projects which covering all those aspects. We have a clear starting date and a clear end, mm -hmm. and you have something which is impacting the life of the consumers out there, the life of the people and the health of the planet. So a project, if it is run well and if it is holistically designed and stuffed with a very good project manager who brings all those different stakeholders together can be very effective. We have good examples. So we are running projects uh, with, with the University of Ghana, for instance. It, it's very practical. It's, it's research in there. We have governmental components. Uh, we have even startups which we plug in and our own expertise. And at the end, you have something which is hitting the market, hopefully having then also a very positive impact. So a project, and then you can put the project in a program, and somebody can run the program, an institute, an academia, whoever uh, that is. But projects with clear <coughs> starting point and end point, and with a clear impact at the end for consumers is, is very suitable. Now, how to balance all that? Um, Yes, very difficult, but like I said, it depends very much on the local context. Mm. The balance will be very different uh, in, under which conditions you operate. And we had very wonderful examples of local nutritional needs, which are impacting then also the fertilizers actually we should use, okay. considering this local nutritional needs. And so we need to look first at the local context before we conclude on the solution. And that is probably what we did the last two decades suboptimal. Mm. Let's say it like that. Uh, you have something which works in Germany and you say, oh yeah, okay, super, we have the solution, let's roll it out. That is not working. Uh, so we need to go very strongly local uh, and to adapt to the local context. And that's why we also created uh, quite a number of local um, innovation centers. And people always ask, why are you doing that? Well, to adapt to the local context, to be optimal in this local context. In terms of nutrition, but also environment. Think it through. The reality is that, um, for instance, the packaging solution, which might be optimal for Germany, where you have some collection systems, some recycling, still a way to go, but there is something. And this solution might not work everywhere. Mm. So if you go then in a different local context, you have a different infrastructure, well, maybe you need a biodegradable packaging rather uh, in order to solve the issue. So this localization of the solution uh, is absolutely key. We should yeah. never forget that. Yeah, I think it's a great point, and I had noted that as well, too. And I would like to drill down a little bit further, because we heard from yesterday from Adam's presentation and also people in the chat who were saying, oh, 
Professor Dronovsky, we don't have the data in Malaysia. <laughs> and Adam just listed a number of countries where tons of data are missing. Then we heard today about the power of AI and data that you can even take, you know, like from statements and unstructured information, etc. So I would like also to hear a bit your views. Um, how are probably also um, specific data that is globally available, accessible, useful to not be starting from scratch at local, uh, in, in the local context? Or in other words, um, Karen, I may also address that question to you because you were saying from local to global and global to local. And I guess in the European Union, we have a whole lot of different uh, cultural backgrounds and countries and needs as well. And yeah, is there kind of a um, opportunity where we can leverage certain knowledge and data versus also addressing the local needs in a more particular manner? Karen, you wanna give it a go? Oh, yes, indeed. Sorry, I wasn't aware the question was directed at me. So, yes, we are actually, um, we're funding quite a few initiatives that um, that explore uh, basically place-based solutions uh, that, that set out uh, the need to um, connect um, outcomes uh, and processes to places and spaces. And this could be at rural level, this could be at urban level, it could be also in regions. Um, this is These are the places and spaces where people actually live and work, and we need solutions at, at, at that level. So we have various instruments uh, available for that. And so we are indeed fostering innovation uh, through a number of, of means. For instance, uh, we have living labs that are being established, policy labs through, throughout Europe um, in relation to our uh, work on food system transformation and also other areas. We'll be setting up over 100 living labs in relation to our soil mission um, that will be uh, d deliver trying to regenerate soils in Europe. So many things going on that are really connecting to uh, to to places. Very good. A any other thoughts in how we can, you know, like use data and localize? Uh, yeah, please, Kamesh. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have probably one example with Nestle, so I'm going to skip that because all of you are from Nestle. What is the point of our collaboration? I'm talking about that. I'll use a different company's example something that uh, we did in Indonesia. Indonesia is a cocoa producing country, but it's been struggling uh, on multiple aspects. One is, you know, because of climate change, rising temperatures, more crop disease, lower yields, lots of issues, right? So we collaborated with uh, Mondelez last year, we announced this pro project, and uh, it's impacting, you know, so we've taken initially 2,000 hectares of heavily uh, deforested brownfield land and we're going to replant it, and the process has already started with shade trees, forest trees, fruit trees, and cocoa trees, right? And we're bringing some of the best knowledge that exists about you know, cocoa agronomy, and uh, you know, we're using the Singapore innovation ecosystem to bring that knowledge, to bring in you know, additional digital technology, et cetera, to make a difference there. And we are hopeful that this is an origin which will you know, you know, thrive, because a lot of people were asking me this question, Kamesh, what is going to happen with climate change? Will a lot of our crops be affected? Will we be able to source? Will we be able to make our favorite brands? Well, it turns out there's a lot of knowledge already available to start to address it. You know, and if we can start getting these partners together, transfer that knowledge. So there's a fantastic soils program that's going on in Africa. We're taking a lot of the knowledge and taking it to Indonesia and making that available there. So you know, so I'm very excited about the AI bit, but uh, I also would like uh, you know, uh, HI, human intelligence, also to work more, so we can share and learn from each other. That, I think it's an extremely uh, valuable point, the knowledge transfer. And I think technology transfer is probably also a, a topic at some point. Um, now, it, it requires a lot of change. Oh, Karen, you want to, uh, Ozila, sorry, you want to add on that? I mean, there is a lot and a lot of open data worldwide. It's amazing the amount of data that yeah. is actually accessible. Um, the hardest part is actually what question do you want to ask? Okay, yeah. what do you want to do with the data? I think that's a much harder part. And then knowing how clean your data is. Okay, so that's really actually the hardest part. It's, we always complain about not enough data, but we actually don't know what to do with it. Same with the knowledge. The knowledge is out there, but how to collect it. Then we have to separate between 
data that is public goods, like uh, weather, land, and things like that, and data that belongs to an individual. Okay, when we look at what they eat or so, there we enter into major, major privacy issue, um, compliance issue, and regulatory issues which change between, which differ extremely between countries, which can also be collected and manipulated. I mean, in the genetic data, there is already countries that are collecting DNA genetic data to kind of then profile um, <clears throat> the, the society with the potential future cost of healthcare afterwards. So we have to distinguish between the data. Sorry. No, no, thank you. Uh, Lindy, please. But I'm still thinking there's a lot we need to do on the policy front in terms of data. We continue mm. to plan on wrong data and yet there are instruments now that could allow us to collect data provided the supplier is willing mm -hmm. and also understands the implications of, of sharing correct data. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I look at the cell phone technology in Africa, that's one powerful tool now for advisory services, but we're not doing enough for transmitting mm -hmm. data from the user back for processing so as to inf inform policy development. So I think we need to sharpen that area in terms of collecting data that is correct. Thank you. Charles. Uh, very much agree with, with what has just been said by speakers. And the colleague of mine always says that the issue is not big data, it's big signal, how you get that, uh, how you get that out. And um, I, I think there are a number of, of aspects of that. One is analytics, and we've heard today about some of what can be done by AI. Um, but there is also a real issue about data curation and data quality, uh, which sometimes, to a certain extent, you can use technology, technology to overcome that, but some of that actually does need proper curation. Um, and I think that there is a role for public organizations, universities, big international organizations, to actually be a repository of trusted data. And I see this particularly in the environmental consequences of different food at the moment, and that there's um, a large ecosystem of small companies out there who provide metrics and things for bigger companies such as Nestle, and they're doing a really good job, but the data upon which they often provide their services is not that great, and I think it's a role for the public world to provide a better curated, trusted data source yeah. that then can be processed by the private sector in a way that's useful for a big company such as Nestle. Great, thanks a lot. I think we Maybe Peter, yeah, go one, ahead. one comment. I, I agree, absolutely, we need to continue working on data. But you said it as well, the next two, three years are critical. Mm. So there is urgency. And, and in some areas, uh, I dare to say, we have enough data to act now. Yeah. And uh, so it, there we cannot wait for additional data, we need to move. Uh, so we continue getting a more solid database, answer the questions we need to answer, phrase the questions, define them. But in the meantime, let's not forget, we need to move. Because, you know, the clock is ticking, really. Mm -hmm. and, and if you see what's happening now in terms of food insecurity, probably we have uh, the next 12 to 18 months uh, huge problems on, on a global level. So we need to move. And, and one should not replace the other. Uh, I said it always also to my team. Where you have enough data, you move. And don't wait and don't get it then to, to the 100% if you're already at 98 or 99. You move, you get a solution, and you get the solution out of the door. So I think it's very important mm. uh, to keep the momentum and to accelerate even there. <laughs> exactly. And I think that was another question uh, that I would like to address to the panel in terms of what are the catalyzers for change. So we understood we have elements, some ready to move. We need to create urgency. We need to create scale. We need to create impact. So what are potential catalyzers? Also, I think I'm building a bit on Monique's presentation this morning when we said, you know, like there is also societal aspect that we need to bring into place. Where do you see big catalyzers that we could also use to move forward faster on the agenda? Osla, you want to give it a try? <laughs> okay. Um, I think the last couple of years have made everybody worldwide rethink what is health. Um, and that actually healthcare is sick care, 
and that food is actually healthcare. You talked about the diets before, the Western diet was a disaster. And most people can't even afford a doctor, okay? So we also have to look into that. So everybody is thinking more and more, how do we stay away from sick care? And I think this is part of our great opportunity to really look into um, behavior change, because ultimately you can push the products out, you can push them to the customer, but uh, you, know, you can bring the horse to the water, but you can't make it drink, okay? And I think that's a discussion we just had before, how difficult it was to do that. So I think we should not lose this opportunity. Um, then there's, of course, the element of personalization, uh, and that we had uh, personalization nutrition. Um, that is very luxurious. Most people can't afford it. But there's a lot of common sense um, or key messages that come out of it which we can apply and which you can also use through people testing. Okay? We have to see what works and what doesn't work because the health uh, starts actually with the quality of the soil. Okay? What's in the soil impacts what's in the food, what gets into your body, what gets into you, what you then absorb. So it's the whole chain. So you cannot be a healthy human without a healthy environment. So automatically they're kind of linked. So as we look into this and there's this desire, I think will be a missed opportunity to not really take this up because worldwide, I think for once, worldwide, everybody is interested in this. <laughs> mm. yeah. Yeah, obviously, the most effective is if somebody wants it. So if you have a consumer who says, I want the thing. So uh, if we educate consumers also a bit better in nutrition, <coughs> for instance, uh, it's actually a shame, the nutrition knowledge, which is in the broader public. And that's one part of the problem. Yeah. And for sustainability, it's to some extent also not so different. Huh? But for nutrition, it's really a shame. Uh, there's nothing done at the schools, in many schools. So the kids are searching their wisdom, like I said, in social media. Is social media the best teacher of nutrition? Probably not. Uh, and, and here we have to do a much better job as a community. And for instance, recently, last week, I had a, to a discussion with somebody from, from Google. I said, yeah, people are searching for nutrition information on Google. But the reality is that this quality of this information which you provide is unfortunately not, not uh, always great. So here, there's a job to be done. If consumers really, if people are asking for it, that's the best way. Uh, then the whole machine is, is running. Huh? And it's, it's much easier than, than, than a push approach, mm -hmm. which we have to do as well. Don't get me wrong, we have to do also certain things without consumers asking for. But if we educate consumers, they know what proper nutrition is, they know how to compose their diet in a balanced way, then that's, that's healthy. That, that helps. Yeah, Lindy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so Stefan has said it. I think it was said yesterday, we fail on food, we fail on everything. And I think we are sitting at at an opportunity where we can talk economics, we can talk environment, we can talk human health, and we have a unifying force under food where all the 17 sustainable development goals are connected. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we need? We need proper messaging that allows everybody to sort of see their role, both as a solution, but also as an actor in making things happen. And I think we had lost it. Food was more related more to just economics. If I can't afford it, I don't have to do it. And then the extreme side was the environment side. Mm -hmm. But now it's all connected. Mm -hmm. So let's find those nuggets of communication and evidence mm -hmm. that are not either or, but collectively economics, socially, environmentally, how do we deliver a healthy yeah. diet? And I think we are slowly getting it. Yeah, thank you, Lindy. First, uh, Charles, then Kamesh. Uh, can I come and then back? probably Karen as well, because she's sitting as well, but in that order. I just wanted to come back to the issue of the consumer, and I completely agree with Stefan that um, the products that the food system produces must be uh, acceptable to the consumer. Uh, a lot can be done with education. Um, we do not educate our kids enough about food as, as we have. And all that is absolutely good. But let me go back to what you said, Stefan, about the urgency of what we had to do. And I think there is now sufficient academic research that even though everything we do at the consumer level is good, it is not going to be enough. I worry about a narrative that is completely consumer focused, that it allows governments to escape from doing difficult things. I worry about the narrative that it should be the private sector that does everything because that allows governments to um, get away without making hard decisions. 
And I think we as individuals also have to provide the politically permissible space for governments to take some of the hard decisions that are just need to go to, go to be done if we address the, the, the urgent challenges that Stefan articulated. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so I'll just, uh, you know, I just want to see if we can look at all of this through an economic thread, right? So when COVID first hit, as an ingredient supplier, we were amazed by the number of people who suddenly start talk, stopped talking about cost, just about securing supply. You know, our factories are going to come to a stop if I don't get this material. So suddenly it didn't matter what the price was. And that's all we heard for years and years, right? So uh, just one thought I want you to think. Now, the second piece of this is, uh, you know, as we've come out of this and everything has uh, come back again, everybody's again talking about cost, right? But what did COVID do? COVID also impacted our producer communities quite dramatically. A lot of farmer communities got impacted. And here there's an interesting piece I want to illustrate to you. Uh, so we did a lot of work in Ghana. There's a lot of single holder women farmers who produce cashew in Ghana, right? So what we noticed is that, uh, you know, when they get the produce and they get the price, and the, the quality of nutrition that that family gets is very, very good. And then as they go into the, you know, the rest of the uh, season, then the quality of the nutrition that the family is enjoying comes down quite dramatically, right? The other thing we noticed is there's a significant issue with plant protection chemicals being you know, detected in that cashew, which makes it, you know, you really can't export it to a lot of countries because you've got those residues which you know, make it less valuable, so you get less price. So, and then of course yield is a problem because they don't have the access to the best agronomic practices, knowledge, et cetera. So we partnered with the general, uh, German Development Agency, got funds. We brought in companies that are expert in beekeeping so we made you know, beekeeping available to the, uh, the women farmers, taught them how to do it. Then we found companies that bought the bees wax and bought the honey, okay? Now this part is very interesting because you put it all together, the, you know, the yield is going up, the, you know, they're not now spraying crazy chemicals on it, and it's a lot, lot more you know, valuable, therefore the price is going up, and a whole bunch of these things. So we were able to deliver $1,000 of additional income to each of those you know, single uh, women farmers and that thing. But the story doesn't end there. For me, the real opportunity there is now to take this product, which is run by you know, the, the single women, you know, single uh, you know, unit holder farmers, and see if I can convert that to a snack and deliver it to consumers who care about it. You know, we keep hearing that you know, people won't pay for sustainability. It turns out there are 20% of European consumers who care about sustainability and are willing to pay for it. And sure enough, we found two brands that are very excited to take that forward and now working with them to commercialize it. So and that's what I keep telling people is that, look, we can't do this alone. We have to get all these partners together, link it together, and find ways to happen. And I would say Nestle, for example, has tons of information. As much as you're bringing information into your system, the you know, more you share, I think more the rest of the world is going to benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Kamesh. So Karen, and then we'll open up for questions to the audience. So Karen. Thank you, Petra. So um, you're asking about the cal catalyzers of change, and we mentioned, or I mentioned earlier, that research and innovation are drivers of change and a means to get things done all together in co-creation and with the ambition to provide solutions to multiple objectives using a systemic and transdisciplinary approach. Now, we see Horizon Europe as a catalyst for dire directionality. It is, in fact, the world's largest, and I dare to say even most ambitious, public research and innovation program, with a seven-year budget of 90, over 95 billion euro, and at least 35% of this, so at least 85 billion of these are earmarked for what we call climate action. And of course, food system transition is very much also um, in the context of climate action. Uh, but EU funding is only the, what we call the cherry on the cake. Most of the public research and innovation funding is actually happening in the member states. Uh, so Horizon Europe helps, helps to set direction and serves to align and mobilize this member state funding. So by providing um, the budget that we do, we hope to mobilize an even bigger budget to tackle the, the issues that are, that are dear and urgent. Now, via Horizon Europe, there's many ways to foster change. It has three pillars ranging from basic research to innovation deployment. And most of the food and agriculture research and innovation is actually being steered via Horizon Europe's what we call Cluster 6. And it's there that we're deploying our Food 2030 strategy. 
uh, designed to, uh, to deliver food system transition in support of the European Green Deal and Farm to Fork and Biodiversity and Circular Economy Strategies. And through it, through our Food 2030 work, we're fostering and seeding research and innovation on issues um, as diverse as alternative proteins and dietary shift, personalized nutrition, microbiome solutions, food reduction, food waste reduction and valorization, just to name a few. And I mentioned before the new food systems partnership called Sustainable Food Systems for People, Planet and Climate to be launched next year. And this will bring together different sta stakeholders um, around the table for to build a strategic long term vision also describe, uh, prescribing to our Food 2030 vision and priorities. And its objective is really to mobilize research and innovation funders and performers towards jointly established and impact-driven goals to pool efforts and resources and to align and leverage investments, all with a view to accelerate the transition towards healthy diets that are sustainably produced and consumed in uh, EU and global food systems. And another novel ever, uh, element of Horizon Europe is its five missions. Maybe you've heard of these. These missions are new um, goal-oriented flagships calling for new and innovative ways of working together across programs and funding instruments to improve the lives of people in Europe and beyond. And these go beyond research and innovation. Um, there's all of the missions, all five missions are relevant to food systems to different degrees, but in particular, there's one dealing with soil health entitled a soil deal for, for Europe. And this will pioneer the transition towards healthy soils by 2030. And of course, soils are the basis for healthy and nutritious food. No soils, no food, no food, no life. Good. Thank you so much, Karen. So please, so we open for questions from the audience. Erich. Thanks a lot for great discussion and, and your valuable comments. I just wanted to direct the view also, let's say, since we have now a great opportunity here to see, let's say, experts along the value chain. And I, I very much appreciate this symposium to, to show the context of the different players. I would like to guide also, uh, let's say, your thoughts into the opposite direction, because when Stefan or some of you explored, did we sometimes miss the local context or we sometimes miss what the so certain consumer groups in certain geographies and, and so forth uh, would prefer? So to do the opposite direction and not only walk from farm to fork, but from the, from the consumer, from the fork to the farm, because then we, we do a re, what we engineers call reverse engineering. And uh, I'm very much in favor of that because then we would also not run into degrading our processing toolbox and saying we over process. If we have a clear target and go backwards, we will process in order to reach the target. And this is, this is the meaningful uh, definition of a toolbox and not to go into the wrong direction, but into meeting the target best. And this is why I, I very much prefer to, to think back and forth and, and recommend this in, in order to really uh, have a, a focus, a clear focus, which is what we want to reach. Thank you so much, Eric. Any comments? Otherwise, we move to the next question. You have questions also from... Yes, there's a question from Yasmin Oi from Malaysia. So over the last two days, there's been a lot of interesting discussions on farm to fork. But what about from sea to fork? There are many maritime nations that rely on mar marine proteins. What are the impacts of overfishing? I mean, perhaps I'll just say, I mean, that's a great question, uh, Yasmin, and uh, especially in Southeast Asia, where I think 40% of protein comes from uh, both freshwater and, and marine sources. Um, we sometimes forget about management of marine, uh, marine and freshwater uh, resources. Um, it is a sad statistic that if we managed our fisheries better, then we could increase our yield really quite uh, sub substantially. Uh, and I think that's a challenge for both national and international govern governance. And as someone who's worked quite extensively in Malaysia, then we need to learn from uh, some of the wonderful integrated systems that you get in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, um, and uh, countries such as that where you have livestock production, crop production, and fish production brought together in a holistic and very sustainable way. Stefan? If you talk marine uh, environments, uh, we have two dimensions we as a company uh, working on. One is we are developing plant-based seafood. 
also to help a bit with the overfishing of, of, of the oceans. And the other one we are looking into seaweed. And uh, maybe in the future there will be seaweed farms. Uh, and then the, the term farm uh, covers not only the terrestrial environment, but also the marine aquatic environment. And seaweed uh, has some interesting properties. Uh, it can be used as a biostimulant on fields. We still have to see whether it works still in the supply chain, because at the end you need to get the seaweed also on the field. Um, then it's very nutritious, rich in, in uh, and we know that, uh, PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, and we can probably use it also in foods. But we need also to see uh, how we manage then the strong fish flavor, the strong uh, yeah, algae flavor, uh, which doesn't work in all the products. Huh? Uh, so we're working on both. Uh, I think it's a very valid comment. Uh, so if we talk farm, we cover, we, we thought also about uh, the marine environment. We have not forgotten that. Also the discussion the symposium was mainly on the terrestrial environment, but uh, it's very important to consider in the future also the oceans, first of all, as something to protect, very important, but then also as something which can be uh, a, 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 yeah, a source of, of very nutritious raw materials. Yeah. Good. Next question. Yeah, in the back. Kagan. Yes. Um, <clears throat> we talked a lot farm to fork. Uh, we know we've waste a lot, about 30%. Uh, the topic of circular food was never raised so far. I mean, we talked about sustainability, but but really, you know, how do we get a circular economy? Um, by the way, can also be healthy. What are your thoughts on that? Who wants to take it? Yeah, look, uh, uh, Calvin, uh, maybe I can briefly comment on that. Uh, obviously, we are looking, and also together, by the way, with, with your companies, uh, quite a bit how to valorize the byproducts we have in the agricultural uh, supply chain. However, and that's something which we also, because and Remco made the point very nicely this morning, I think it's very important to see to what extent we can afford processing and still remain sustainable and, and still have an equation which works also on the affordability side and, and still protecting the nutrients. So I think it was in this respect a very enlightening and hopefully for some of you an enlightening and a wonderful talk. So uh, processing then of the side streams valorization in a way that it really makes sense because I came uh, amongst along so many examples of um, yeah, upcycled uh, uh, side streams, waste streams, and then you do all the life cycle assessment at the end, you come to the conclusion, well, this is worse than the original product. <laughs> and then uh, we, we have to question. Eh? But it's very valid to look at all those, and I'm sure we will find approaches to, to, make, to use that much better. Uh, whether spent grains, press cakes, whatever uh, you, you might take. Eh? Uh, now, circularity in food, at the end, yes, you have the food waste, uh, which, you, which you can also valorize. Uh, you can uh, use it to create energy, but also we are looking into how can we do, for instance, the packaging material with that. So if you have, at the end, some of the peels, uh, 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 some of uh, the brands coming out, uh, we can, for instance, valorize them also in packaging. But to get more circularity, not only in, in, in the pure plastic uh, element, but also in the organic element of a food product and in the food stream itself makes perfectly sense. I think it's a very valid point, yeah. Charles. I'll give this brief answer. I wouldn't have given it if it was just before lunch, but it is just after lunch. And that is another element of the circular economy is what we do with human waste. And I was involved with a project with Chinese colleagues working out um, the greenhouse gas efficiencies that would result if the amount of waste that was produced in China could then be converted into fertilizers. And it really was enormous. And of course, there are real technical issues there. There are engineering tissue, uh, issues about how one would, uh, um, how one would uh, get the, um, the uh, product to the farm and things like that. There are real health issues as well. It's a very good reason why we don't have human excrement on, on soils and things. And there are enormous uh, social issues as, as well. So there are some real challenges there that sort of <coughs> butt up against many of the social, economic, and logistic constraints within the food system. 
Before moving to Tamás, Karen, I guess you have also probably something to share on circularity. Yes, uh, I tried to raise my hand. <laughs> I don't know if it's yeah. visible uh, um, to you, but anyhow, I, I thought I'd maybe respond to the two issues, so the, the seat of fork and, and both and circular economy. So um, much of the work that we're doing, uh, when we say farm to fork, it's it's a, a set of buzzwords, I guess you could say, but they, they do not exclude in any way the seat of fork uh, and food from the oceans, uh, be it uh, freshwater um, or, 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 or oceans and and seas. Um, and in fact, under our Food 2030 strategy, we have one dedicated pathway for action on, on food from the ocean, and it's focusing in also on the potential of sustainable aquaculture. So there's actually quite a bit of innovation happening in, in that area. Um, to try and make the, 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 the activity much more sustainable than, than it has been. And in terms of circular economy, this is one of our uh, priorities uh, to deliver co-benefits and circular economy basically relates to uh, energy efficiency, um, use of um, of water, use of you know how do we diminish the the use of inputs all across the uh, the, the food system, be it water, be it energy, be it fertilizers. Um, it's it's all part of of the of the work we do and the projects we we try and seed and we have uh, what we call a bioeconomy strategy uh, that seeks to valorize uh, the biomass, the unusable biomass. Um, and transform it into different services and, and, and products. So uh, much, much work and innovation going on uh, in the Commission on, on these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Tamas, you have a question. Uh, I, I am very grateful that to have been invited to this. I agree that this is an unusually broad and uh, um, internationally as as well as topic-wise symposium, even by national standards, which is working in many countries. Nevertheless, I believe we will all leave this place with a great frustration if we don't come up with a list. Not today, not here, but if you were able to get us here and organize all the addresses and all the schedules, then you surely can organize the the answers of everybody to a list of the five or six most important problems. Then let, after that, in peace, chew on them. Are they technically, price-wise, and so feasible? It is, if we don't do this, it's we are wasting a very good crisis. All of you are in agreement on only one thing, that the time is short. Now, that means we are in a crisis mode. And when that happens, that is a good crisis, don't waste it. Now, it may be so that it will not be Nestle or somebody else exactly in the, in the, but if we don't ask everybody, what are the five biggest problems? So I would have come out from here to say that we have to set those problems by, per countries where we expect to be hunger, whether it's for migration, whether it's for drought or so, where it's going to be likely to be hunger and where it's already. The second for me is this movement of plant-based food. This is a fed, a partial fed, or it is something we will have to do, and in which case, what do we do with the necessary iron? Do we fix phytic acid in the plant, or do we promote chicken farming on the side? But this is already three, right? Yeah. And I am sure that Sir Charles Godfrey, who has just stepped down from the former empire's incredible overview <laughs> of the entire world, East and West Africa and South Africa and all the rest, have been serving on committees of the Joint Nation. So I recall the, the atmosphere of, of both pride of organization, but also responsibility of what is there now. Both of them are not really, really fair towards one each, one other, because mm. 
you are not fair for independent yeah. countries to be responsible, but you, are, you feel that. On mm -hmm. the other hand, there is a lot of things which work very well in these countries uh, as compared to the neighbors. Yeah. And so I would like us to think about, to agree on five. If we pick, and it may turn out that none of them do you find is feasible or that you do not want to engage in it as Nestle, but if you share it with everybody, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And I would like to add one other issue, and that is that scalability is here often discussed in separation to feasibility. So I often hear colleagues, including your CTO, whom I personally and otherwise appreciate very much, to say it's too expensive. I believe from my former experience that the world is full of, of surprises. When we said that the biologicals will cost $60,000, and they will have to be injected, the entire board of Roche said to us, forget it, forget it. You know that 60% of their profit mm -hmm. comes from German tech. Yeah. That's number one. So we can't predict it. If it works, it works. So just show us that you can do it in large scale. Maybe it's expensive, but if we know that it works, like say, degrading phytic acid so it doesn't yeah. become an anti-nutrient. I'm sticking to it because it's yes. today's. If you show it works on large scale, but you find it expensive, then we can think about that the way you do, we can perhaps make it cheaper mm -hmm. because you do it with a casein or with another complex. And we can think of others, but show it that it is scalable. That's an additional aspect of it. And once we would come to five important things, even if none of them will be taken up, it's a useful exercise, not wasting. Yeah. The, you got the people here from the whole world, from different political organizations, international organizations, national ones, NGOs, and, and a lot of knowledge, mm. and a very successful business. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I think so, uh, Charles made it a little bit easier for us because he, he listed four. <laughs> so he <laughs> helped with the simplification. Uh, Tamaj, I appreciate, just one sec, I appreciate really the comment and also to be thought provoking. May I turn that into a question to each panelist to say we need to address nutritious, we need to address safety. You named, you, you listed them in the beginning, affordability, equity. Uh, so can I ask you, to turn that into not into priority, but also trade-offs. I think that for me is, as a very pragmatic person, also an understanding where do you also think that we can go practically about trade-offs that will deliver impact, but also will turn into true action. Charles, you want to kick us off? Uh, I'd rather not, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've done that. Um, that was a fascinating question. I've been involved in a couple of exercises which has tried, and I'm going to change the question a bit, Petra, forgive me, that has tried to look at uh, research priorities for a better food system. And uh, I remember one we voted at the end. And so I'm going to tell you what my priority is. I'd like to put up a big, big prize. And that is someone who could take the uh, Harbour Bosch process and make it much, much more environmentally uh, efficient than it is at the moment. The problem with the way we produce fertilizer at the moment is almost too cheap. Perhaps it'll be a, a bit more of a challenge with gas prices at the moment. But I think, uh, and I'm thinking now more on the environmental side of the food system rather than the health food system. That is the, I, I think. Can you, can you turn the mic on? From water as photosystem two does. Two molecules of water, one molecule of oxygen, two molecules of so hydrogen. They came up with, this would have had the greatest <laughs> impact on the world. In the exercise <laughs> I did, improved photosynthesis was number two, so I think we agree. Great, thank you. Who wanna go next? I think another one we can look at is reducing food loss and waste. 
and really at the farm level and at the household level, the cold chain is still an area of investment where we can make a difference. But the challenge is really affordability and maybe use of more of renewable energy that will allow those refrigerators mm -hmm. that are eco-friendly but would allow less wastage. But also using drying technologies, reconstituting mm -hmm. dried foods. That's what I was raised on in my grandmother's farm. We discarded that technology, but I think it needs to come back. Mm. We, we can save a lot by drying and then reconstituting food. I think also the trade-off and your scalability which you raise uh, depends really, and I, I hope I made the point, very much on local conditions. The trade-off we face with somebody who has 60% of his free income on food versus somebody who has 5% is a different one is a totally different one. And the scalability of a process in uh, Central Africa and in the middle of Minnesota might differ. Uh, so uh, I think it's very important not to fall in the pitfall. Now we go on global conclusions on some of those things. It leads to a suboptimal uh, situation. And, uh, I'm, but I'm also convinced uh, that we will find on the local level solutions which work. Even if you take packaging, I made a point, <laughs> a, a recyclable packaging uh, solution, which is wonderful if you have a recycler, somebody who collects the thing, who is doing a physical or chemical recycling, and at the end you get pure circularity, you get again a food grade packaging. Wonderful. This works only if the infrastructure is there. If no infrastructure is there, well, the solution is a different one, the scalability is totally different. And the trade-off is also a different one. I, I, th I think if you are in a, in a scenario where 5% of the income is spent on food, it's not a question so much of an affordability of a healthy diet. It's more a question of education of consumers. But if you are in a scenario where 60-70% of the income is spent on food, well, you can educate as much those consumers as you wish, it will not lead to success. We need then to have affordable, nutrient-dense product. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's, I, I'm not at all frustrated uh, with, this, uh, with, the, with the symposium, I must say just the opposite, I'm very excited, I must say, because we got so much input. To come to conclusions, so, is still very important. And to go away and say, well, uh, urgency, um, then uh, the localization of solutions is important, and to look at each problem holistically. Uh, I think that, that's very important for all of us to, to recognize that. So from this point of view, I think the local element, uh, I would never forget. And that was for me also a, a bit of learning, I must say. Uh, initially, when the discussion around sustainability started, the first thing is said, okay, what works everywhere? Increasingly, you come to the conclusion, well, we, the better we adapt, the better will be the result. And some things work everywhere, but not everything. <laughs> Very good. So um, with that, we have a few minutes left for each of our dear panelists to make a short concluding remark, which can or not include priorities and trade-offs. <laughs> you don't have to. So um, I think we do uh, what Ari suggested also, reverse engineering. So we have a reverse order. So we start with you, Karen. All right. So just uh, thinking about the, 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 the co-benefits and trade-offs, I think some of the most important things that we can do, and as you mentioned already, because they create so much greenhouse gas emissions, is eating less animals and reducing food waste. And we know that both of these activities deliver um, positive elements to, to many on many facets. They will, of course, also, in particular, eating less animals, um, create winners and, lo and losers. And so then how do we help the losers or those that need to shift to something else? How do we help them do that? And so I think we probably need more research and innovation to, to help this transition. And one field of, of science that I think we, we can do much more on is precision fermentation and, and making use of the microbiome. I think this will open up many, many opportunities in multiple sectors. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Karen. So, Stefan. Look, I have to close the conference. So just the panel. Close just the panel. Uh, so the, I, I think it was a very a good discussion showing the different elements of what, what needs to be done to come to a sustainable 
uh, food system which delivers nutritious, tasty, and affordable products. So from this point of view, I'm, I think it was a very good uh, exchange, and also the need to collaborate and to pull together in, in one direction uh, as a community, I think is important. I liked also the point you made, uh, uh, Charles. Yes, consumer is one, policymakers is another one. Uh, so uh, you named that uh, very nicely in your intro. Uh, everybody has a role to play. And if everybody plays this role correctly, I think there's hope that uh, there's very good hope that uh, and we can be optimistic that we are going to solve uh, the issues which you mean that. Thank you. Come ask your final thought. Final thought? Okay. That sounds like a <laughs> From this one. panel discussion. <laughs> yeah. So um, basically, I think uh, you kind of heard all different versions of whatever I said. Really, you know, context-based solutioning, bringing in the, uh, you know, the power of alliances and really, you know, bringing in knowledge, human intelligence for all that already exists and really uniting it. Uh, we saw the power, the Nestle chefs did this amazing job of bringing diversity, right? What a range of foods we enjoyed, right? So I think that's possible. But, you know, I, I'm always uh, horrified when I read the newspaper and they've, again, done another product with a corn or a rice or whatever. I mean, really, there's just so many options available. Why not? And finally, I guess, you know, I think upcycling uh, is probably been understood incorrectly. There's just lots of opportunity. I'm very optimistic. That's it. Thank you, Kamesh. Lindy V. So for me, I think um, the big statement is that being in food business is being in the best space for solving the problems that we face today. Food is our medicine. If we don't solve food systems related climate emissions, we will hit two degrees very soon. So food is an opportunity to be climate smart. And three, food is leisure and pleasure. So all hands on deck and we are going to be happy individuals. Thank you so much, Lindy. Ursula. Okay, we talked a lot about um, consumer behavior and changing consumer behavior. <clears throat> but I think there is much too much contradictory information out there. You know, you should do this diet or this diet or this micronutrient and this micro, and we don't, and it's impossible for a consumer to even know what is right or wrong. And it's the trust in governments and the trust in corporates is at an all time low these days. So I think we have to look at how we educate them. <clears throat> and then this is where the personalized health comes in because your genetics and also your environment, the pollution you're in will have an impact on what kind of micronutrients and things you do. So there's a component of personalization that you cannot really get around if we look at what's the right diet for you. And one other side comment, I think there's so much knowledge in history um, in the tribal food or in Chinese medicine food or in Ayurveda. I didn't see any of this reflected in the discussions we had and the potential impact on what kind of nutrition is. We talked a lot about the Western w w view and improving the Western world, but I think there's a lot, a lot of knowledge here we could really harness. And Charles, please. I, I really hope I'm wrong, but I suspect that the next two years is going to be a really tough time for global food systems. And a lot of people, especially the people least able to bear it, are going to suffer. Um, but it will mean that food will be quite high up the political spectrum. And all of us in different ways should use that as an opportunity to argue for change for the better. And we should do that as individuals, just the right thing to do as individuals. We should do it um, in the organizations that we work. Um, and if I might be bold, I would say that a great and progressive company such as Nestle, which has a huge amount of influence, you too can be a force for good in this. So uh, I think we should seize the opportunity of what I suspect will be food quite high up the policy agenda over the next few years. Thank you so much to all these panelists.